Hi guys, this is my second try. Uh, again, this is a test just to figure out if I'm able to connect live on my phone. I'm having an issue with my laptop today because apparently I think there's a new uh, way to connect live to Facebook and I can't seem to figure it out. And I had promised you guys I was coming in today to do a live Q&A uh, this morning at 8 a.m. Eastern time and I'm obviously late, about 20 minutes already, because I can't seem to figure this out. So instead, I'm using my mobile phone. I don't know if you can see me and hear me. I, I see here that I've got two friends uh, listening in. So if you're here and you wanna say hello, uh, oh, there's seven now, so possibly, yes. So Pamela uh, is uh, here and maybe a few of you. So I think I'm gonna try to use this method for now. Uh, I know it's not, um, I, I will put my phone down somewhere uh, and I'll properly introduce myself because I do think this is going live on my phone, but for some reason not. Uh, Pamela says hello. Thank you, Pamela. Uh, make me, making me feel a little bit better now. So possibly uh, Angela saying hi. So I think this is the way I'm gonna go. I apologize once again for being late. Um, I'm gonna connect my phone to my headset so you guys can hear me better. But anyway, I'm gonna put this down here and see if it's a little bit more stable. I might not be able to see all the questions for just a second. I'm gonna to try to connect my audio and we'll start the live video. So for those of you that don't know me yet, that we haven't met yet, my name is Nadia Pateguana. I'm one of the TFM uh, fasting coaches and I also wrote a book um, recently published with Dr. Jason Fung called the PCOS Plan, Prevent and Reverse Polycystic Ovary Syndrome Through Diet and Fasting. Uh, and, uh, thank you guys, super encouraging uh, messages here for my technical glitch. This is the second time the same glitch has happened. The first time somebody in our team was able to help me figure it out. But this time, I think it's, um, I'm, uh, I'm just not figuring it out. So anyway, this is what I'm hoping. Uh, that will happen today. Those of you that are already here, so so far I've got uh, a whole lot of you guys here already. Thank you so much, 48 of you. And those of you that this is way too early for, and I totally understand that it's 8 a.m. Eastern, which means it's a lot earlier for a lot of other parts in the world. But uh, I'm hoping that those of you that are here and that have come here specifically for this, um, that I will try to get to your questions first. Keeping in mind that lots of you have sent me a whole lot of questions already about our book, about PCOS in general. So I will start uh, by trying to answer any of the questions of the ladies, I'm assuming, and some men. I've gotten some great feedback from some gentlemen that have uh, actually read our book, and I so appreciate that. Doctors and, and just uh, people that were interested. Some of my clients just did it, uh, I guess, because they're, as, as uh, one said yesterday, biased and just out of loyalty, which I, I totally appreciate. So if you have some specific questions about our book, if you already got the Kindle or the Audible version, or if you're one of the lucky few to get a paperback copy and you have a specific question uh, of one of the pages or the, a chapter that you've read and that you'd like me to address here, I will certainly start with those. Um, I also, as I said, have a whole bunch of, email, uh, of questions that I received from you over email. My email is nadia at thefastingmethod.com and you can still uh, send me some more questions because as you will see later uh, in this post, in a previous post that I've uh, sent, there will be another uh, live Q&A tomorrow on Instagram, so at the Fasting Method uh, Instagram page. And there will be a Zoom webinar next Friday, so May 1st there will be a Zoom webinar where I will have quite a few people in. Uh, it's by invitation only, so you do have to send me an email to nadia at thefastingmethod.com and I will send you the webinar details to join in. And you just have to send me a question, particularly if you have a question specifically about our book, a, you know, a reference a page number or a chapter or a paragraph in our book that I can address, okay? So for that reason, I already have a whole bunch of questions uh, that people have sent me. So if, if people listening in today, watching today, have a few questions, I'll uh, get to those. And in, while you're typing away your questions, maybe I'll get to some of the most commonly asked questions that I've already been sent. So one of the questions that people often ask, and I'm going to start with that, is 
what kind of sweetener, and this is this was the very first question I received when our book came out, but what kind of sweetener is better for women with PCOS? So my answer might shock some of you, but it isn't uh, any different than the TFM message in general, Dr. Fung and Megan Ramos um, blog posts and all our resources. So women, women with PCOS are no different than, uh, well, of course we're different, everybody's different, but the, the, the root cause of PCOS is no different than the root cause of obesity. So what's reflected on the obesity code uh, or no different, the root cause is no different than diabetes. So what we talk, what Dr. Fung talks about in the diabetes code and what we talk about in our program in general. So the root cause of PCOS is insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, high levels of insulin leading to insulin resistance. Therefore, we're trying to tackle not just carbohydrates and therefore having fake uh, sweeteners and fake um, products uh, that will raise our insulin um, is not going to be beneficial to women with PCOS. So when you ask me something like this, and it's a fair question because women with PCOS tend to have a lot of cravings. We crave a lot of sugar uh, and carbs, just like people that are obese and people that have diabetes. So they try to find substitutes. So they think that the only problem is carbohydrates or sugars. But unfortunately, we now know, and we have a lot of good evidence to tell us that all sweeteners raise insulin. So if the problem is insulin, and the problem with PCOS is insulin, hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance. So if the problem is insulin, then trying to find substitutes for sugar and trying to uh, feed cravings, sugar cravings with sweeteners is not going to be beneficial to women with PCOS. So somebody asked me specifically, I heard that monk fruit is a better um, sweetener or substitute uh, for women, women with PCOS. And I don't believe that to be true at all. I have nothing against, it's not something that I have specifically against monk fruit. It's that every sweetener, whether it be from a natural source, artificial source, anything that tastes sweet most of the time is going to have an insulin response. And what we're trying to do with women with PCOS is help them through lowering their insulin. So I hope that was clear. That's a very good question. So there's a question here. And I'm going to read it out. It says, is there any reason why my blood sugar raises when I have apple cider vinegar in my fasting window? Well, uh, I'm not sure if that's a PCOS question. So maybe you can clarify that for me because I, I believe you look like a gentleman to me, but I could be wrong. Uh, and today I'm going to try to focus on the PCOS questions, particularly about our book, The PCOS Plan. So this is a great question that you might uh, get answered elsewhere. Uh, if you are a woman with PCOS and you're having trouble with apple cider vinegar, please write in here. Please clarify for me and I'll try to address that. So until I get some more questions here in the chat, I'm going to move on to some of the other uh, super questions that I've received from those of you. And I know that some of you that have sent me questions over email are here probably watching uh, right now or maybe later today. So I want to try to address those. So another question that was asked um, was about exercise. Our book has a, a whole um, a few paragraphs on exercise for women with PCOS. I know that many of you have shared with us, and I myself have done a ton of research into PCOS and books and resources out there, have said that many, many resources claim that the, the way to go for women with PCOS is the good old, uh, you know, eat less, move more. Exercise a ton and reduce your caloric intake. You know, uh, uh, those of you that have been uh, in our program for a while and understand the concept of what we're trying to do um, through lowering insulin with intermittent fasting and a real food diet is that obesity and again, diabetes. And in this case, again, I want to repeat PCOS being no different in that it's a metabolic syndrome expression caused by hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance. Therefore, the good old uh, eat less and move more is also not going to work uh, for uh, women with PCOS. So what, am, what are we trying to say when we talk about exercise? And there's a whole, as I said, there's a whole a few, a few chapters different than other PCOS books that have pages and pages uh, in, in lots of other um, you know, chapters on exercise and uh, telling women with PCOS, this type of exercise is better for you. Well, that, Dr. Fung and I don't agree with that at all. What we write in our book, very specifically about exercise, and you guys know this, intuitively you know this, exercise is important and beneficial to all of us. We need exercise for a whole lot of reasons. 
But is exercise going to reverse PCOS? No. Why? Because the root cause of PCOS is insulin and insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia. So that is the reason why our book doesn't have pages and pages and chapters and chapters focusing on exercise. Our book has pages and pages and chapters and chapters focusing on the strategies to actually lower insulin. What do you need to do to lower insulin? So exercise is wonderful. It's good for your body, your muscles. It's great for your brain, uh, your um, mood, your sleep, for lowering cortisol, which in turn will indirectly impact your insulin, but it is not going to have an impact on your ovaries. It's not, which is what we want to do with women with PCOS, right? Have a direct impact on your ovaries and liver. So um, I'm not discouraging exercise, quite the opposite. I'm encouraging it, we are encouraging it, but we want you to focus on lowering insulin, all right? And so I'll get to the next question, which is the answer is not gonna shock you, but I want this to be very simple. I know it's repetitive. And again, when things are simple and repetitive, that's really a good thing. That means we have a solution. Um, and it's important that we keep ourselves focused on the solution and, and in order to solve the problem. Again, for PCOS women, the problem is insulin resistance and high insulin. And the solution is to lower that through adequate methods, lifestyle methods. And we focus specifically on a real food diet and different types of intermittent fasting for women with PCOS. And a lot of detail in our book and hopefully that will help you get started if you haven't already or help you on your way if you're already there, okay? So the next question is, what supplements do you recommend, Nadia and Dr. Fung, for women with PCOS? And I am going to uh, let you know that in our book, we do not mention any supplements. Uh, again, unlike every other book out there on PCOS that has pages and pages and chapters and chapters of supplements, supplement information. It's not that I, we don't believe that there aren't supplements out there that can uh, help women with PCOS. Maybe there are. Maybe there are, just like exercise, maybe there are some supplements out there that might help with things that are directly or indirectly related to PCOS, but I don't know of any supplement that lowers insulin. Uh, maybe um, one day we will find this out. We haven't yet uh, found any supplement, and really there's no medication to lower insulin, and this is the problem. This is the problem with PCOS. So when it comes to things like supplements, you might be doing exactly the same if you're taking too many supplements and for no reason, uh, or at least, um, haven't, haven't really figured out whether or not it's helpful to you. And if you're not addressing the root cause again, which is insulin, and you're not changing your diet and you're not doing some type of intermittent fasting, then what you might be doing is the exact same thing that the conventional uh, medical system is uh, doing when addressing women with PCOS. Maybe you're just providing symptomatic relief. And we're hoping that women with PCOS will eventually um, have... A, a, a solution or will follow these solutions to address the root cause of their condition. We don't want to put a band-aid over a bullet hole as Dr. Fung says. So we don't recommend supplements for that reason. Not to say that there aren't certain supplements out there that might be beneficial, but we're looking at the big picture. We're looking at addressing the root cause. So uh, I wanted to, to continue on here. Thank you guys for your comments here. And um, I wanted to continue on with some, some other questions before I let you guys go today. And again, those of you that, uh, I'm sorry I was late today for technical uh, reasons as you now know. And those of you who didn't get a chance uh, to watch live, you can watch live later hopefully. So uh, a few other questions. And this one is, is uh, a good question. Again, all the other questions were very good as well. Um, and there was a, a, somebody who wrote in and said, is PCOS really something you can reverse or is it something that you can just put into remission? And of course, this question is asked often about other conditions as well. So let me tell, talk to you a little bit about this. And we talk about this in great detail in the book. What is PCOS? Polycystic ovary syndrome. Well, PCOS is a syndrome. So it's an expression uh, of uh, a number of symptoms. Um, and it's diagnosed by two out of three of the diagnostic criteria. So the diagnostic criteria for PCOS, and this is well detailed in our book, the diagnostic criteria is one, um, clinical or physical expressions of hyperandrogenism, which means um, expressions of uh, excessive male hormones in females, in women. 
So if you're a woman that has a, a few or a lot of expressions of male hormones, for example, hirsutism, which is um, hair growth, uh, male pattern hair growth, like, like upper lip and in other parts of your body, chin, um, excessive hair growth, thick black uh, or, or just a male pattern type of hair growth in a woman. Male pattern baldness in a woman. So you start to lose hair around this section. These are all things that are very apparent and very obvious in women and women in their reproductive years. So very young women. So women in their teens, in their 20s and 30s and 40s having these expressions of, of uh, high male hormones. There are some severe expressions of high male hormones like clitoral enlargement or deepening of the voice or um, a whole bunch of other expressions. You're on lab, your male hormones may be normal or they may be abnormal. You might have too much testosterone on lab as well, but you may have normal uh, lab testosterone levels and have the, still have these male expressions. So the, the diagnostic criteria is actually the clinical expressions as opposed to the laboratory expressions. And this is well detailed in our book. The second diagnostic criteria for a woman getting diagnosed with PCOS is um, irregular menstruation and or ovulation. One of the questions I've gotten here as well, which is a great question and, and I'm sure we'll address it and have addressed it very well in the book, is, is it possible to have a period but still not be ovulating? Unfortunately, yes. And that is actually the, the problem. You could have a period, but if you're not ovulating, then obviously your, your reproduction is, is uh, um, deranged and you won't be able to get pregnant. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But uh, the, the next uh, diagnostic criteria, so the second diagnostic criteria is either irregular menstruation, so periods, and or irregular ovulation. So you could have one and not have the other. And that's, that's a concern for obvious reasons. So that's the second criteria. And the third criteria is polycysts or many cysts on the ovaries on ultrasound. So when a woman goes in and she uh, asks uh, her doctor or the doctor uh, suggests getting tested uh, for PCOS, these are the three diagnostic criteria. This syndrome is a syndrome of exclusion. So often other diseases have to be ruled out first. But when you, once you have two out of these three, then you are diagnosed with PCOS. In our book, we detail uh, through scientific research and um, a lot of detail that Dr. Fung spent the majority of the time working on, on how insulin is actually behind all three of these. How insulin is the one that's causing the abnormal uh, male hormones in women. So how excessive insulin is involved in the, the deranged ovulation and how excessive insulin is involved in uh, the growth of these cysts, so-called cysts, which are actually something else. But if you're a woman and you're diagnosed with all three of these, like I was, okay, I was diagnosed with a frank type of PCOS. I had all of these uh, three expressions of the diagnostic criteria. So you only need two out of the three, but I had three out of the three. So I was diagnosed with frank type of PCOS. And lucky for me, the, this has been a long, long journey for those of you that have read my story in the book or elsewhere. Lucky for me, at some point, I discovered that insulin was behind this. And the solution, even though I wasn't overweight, but many people with PCOS are overweight. It is not, it's an associated condition, as I said at the beginning, but it's not a diagnostic feature of PCOS. So I personally wasn't overweight, but I realized that uh, the symptoms that I had and the, the, my fertility concerns had to do with insulin. So then I addressed the insulin through diet and intermittent fasting. And so what happens as the insulin came down, all of these expressions went away. So all three of the diagnostic criteria then have disappeared. So I know that on ultrasound, I no longer have uh, cysts, these so-called polycysts in my ovaries. I, I know that I ovulate in quite regularly, in fact, and I know that uh, obviously my acne, which was one of my biggest concerns, has cleared up and um, the, the, the hair growth pattern has changed. I no longer have uh, hair loss and all of these other things that were a concern uh, a few years ago, quite a few years ago. So for PCOS specifically, which is a syndrome, polycystic ovary syndrome, if all three diagnostic criteria are gone, then I would like to think because we've, re we've reduced insulin, we've brought it down to its normal levels, which happened with me, it's happened with a lot of our clients, and I hope will happen with you, then yes, in fact, you can no longer get diagnosed with PCOS. So then I do think PCOS is a disease that can be reversed and, and 
has been reversed in, in many, many people. And we're very lucky to have a lot of these women share their stories here in our groups. All right. So that's a, uh, another great and important question because I think women want to know and they've been told that PCOS can never be reversed. Uh, and it can't be reversed if you focus on exercise and supplements and uh, the flawed um, myth of uh, eat less, move more, then no, you won't be able to reverse PCOS. The most you in, in take uh, the pill or uh, go through IVF to get pregnant, then in that case, it, PCO, which is the conventional treatment for PCOS, then no, you will never be able to reverse PCOS. The best that you can do is put a Band-Aid over a bullet uh, hole. However, if you reverse, if you, are, if you reduce uh, and, and normalize your insulin levels through diet and fasting, then absolutely you can reverse PCOS. And I'm, I'm a true testament of that. And so there's a really great question here that says, what is the fasting schedule you recommend for best results in lowering insulin resistance? Well, the, the, it's, a, it's a hard question to answer, but it's a fair question. And I think that we have an, an, a fair amount of protocols for different people, for specific people. For women with PCOS particularly, I like to follow... Um, a woman's sort of goal and, and journey before determining what fasting protocol uh, we should use. So for women getting pregnant or uh, trying to get pregnant, uh, I apologize, trying to conceive, then our, our fasting regimen is slightly different than maybe a woman, uh, a younger woman who's not trying to get pregnant. She wants, maybe has no cycles, maybe is overweight, is trying to regulate, then there's a different fasting schedule for that person. Or maybe an older woman who's um, either had children or no longer interested in having children and um, again might have diabetes, might have some other concern, may or may not be overweight, then there will be a different protocol. Nonetheless, I think that the overall consensus is that in order for you to lower insulin resistance through fasting, you have to find a schedule that works for you and you have to be very consistent. Um, with it. So you may might find some help with some coaching or you might be able to do this on your own with the great resources out there, the books and, and everything else on our site, okay? So uh, I have a question here and I'm going to see if I can read the whole question because I can only see some of it. Here we go. So the question is, so you shared how your thinning hair is no longer a problem. What about those of us who have the symptom of excessive hair growth in unwanted areas? Well, that's another symptom, but it's actually related to the same concern. So women can have both or they can have one but not the other. So this is an expression, as I was saying earlier, I'm not sure if you were here at the beginning of this video, maybe you can rewatch it. Uh, both of these, both the excessive uh, hair growth in areas that you might not like, like upper lip, uh, chin, uh, chest, buttocks area. I mean, uh, women that have PCOS, and if you research this, you'll see uh, how common it is, um, then... This is one expression of excessive male hormones. The other expression is male pattern baldness. So there are two expressions. You may have one and not have the other, but the solution is the same. If you have uh, excess androgens, high male hormones, if, if you're a female with PCOS, then the reason behind it is hyperinsulinemia, high insulin, leading to insulin resistance and vice versa, because it, then it becomes this negative feedback loop. So the solution is to consistently, as I just uh, answered this other person who asked me, to consistently reverse that by finding the correct fasting pattern for you and doing it consistently. Because again, insulin resistance, PCOS, obesity, diabetes, these are metabolic syndrome. These are all conditions that are on a spectrum. You can bring yourself up on that spectrum and you can bring yourself down. Meaning the more insulin, uh, so the, the more often you eat, the more processed foods you eat, the later in the day you eat, the, the more stressed you are, the less you sleep. There's a whole bunch of reasons why your insulin goes up. Then you need to bring it down consistently until you get to a leveled and balanced insulin state because it is a hormone that needs to be balanced and leveled. And once you're there, hopefully these symptoms will go away just like they did for me and many other people. Okay. Um... I have a few other questions here I'd like to get to. Sorry, guys. I just don't want to miss anything. Okay, got to that one. And uh, uh, w one of our coaches here in, in uh, her, Carol Ann has a question. So let me see if I can read her question. As we look at this, how do you feel about looking back to our teen daughters? How can we protect them from a lifetime of PCOS and its negative outcomes? I really appreciate this question, and I'll tell you specifically why. And I address this in the book. I have two daughters. Carol Ann has a whole bunch of daughters, but I have two daughters. They're nine and six. They're, there's their baby pictures right there behind me. Um, 
I'm very grateful for having had these daughters as a woman with PCOS. Women with PCOS are not infertile, um, but they have a lot of concerns and fertility struggles is a big one. And I, I definitely have had my fair share of fertility struggles, but I know now that because I was a woman with PCOS, I did get pregnant and I got pregnant through, through uh, some lifestyle uh, changes, but I did not pursue this throughout my pregnancy. So I had a lot of pregnancy complications, meaning I did not reverse my PCOS before my pregnancies. I simply followed uh, a low carb diet long enough to get pregnant. And once I got pregnant, I stopped following the diet. I didn't think I needed it any longer. So I was a PCOS woman who got pregnant. I had a lot of pregnancy complications. And then I had these two beautiful daughters who today at nine and six years old express a lot of symptoms of metabolic syndrome. So I now understand why. And our role, just like Carol Ann is saying, as mothers today is one, if possible, to prevent this from happening. Those women that have PCOS, uh, hopefully after reading our book and after being in our community, will understand the importance of reversing PCOS before you get pregnant. If you're somebody like me who got pregnant anyway with PCOS and had children uh, in that state, it's very unfortunate but very likely that our children are much more prone to metabolic syndrome. And my children have already both been to uh, an endocrinologist who is already diagnosed what we already know. Uh, sometimes we like to have diagnoses. And so the future for us, even though our program doesn't specifically coach uh, minors, but as mothers, as a mother myself, I talk about this in the book, about the importance of reversing this before you get pregnant, if possible, and about how to deal with it once, uh, once it's happened to you. So luckily for me, I was able to reverse this condition. So I'm much healthier now than I was in my 20s and 30s. But now I have to help my daughters in their, in their journey. So I'll, I'll uh, definitely work on that. So thank you for that, Carol Ann. So a um, few more questions here. Best resource uh, you know in fasting schedule for a 50-year-old woman uh, with multiple medical challenges. So it sounds like you're somebody who has, is on the spectrum of metabolic syndrome, and I'm very happy to say that we have a lot of resources for this. I run a group on Wednesdays through the Fasting Method program, a focus group for women. So we talk to a lot of women, uh, perimenopausal, postmenopausal, premenopausal, and, and we do talk about different fasting schedules and our, our resources as well. So our book speaks specifically about uh, women who have PCOS, but these women with PCOS will eventually become postmenopausal women with metabolic concerns if they don't reverse it before. So I think our book is also very useful for people who have uh, women who have metabolic syndrome in, our, in their postmenopausal years. So hope that's useful to you. So link to book. The book is called The PCOS Plan, and I will create a link here. You can order it on Amazon. It's available on uh, Kindle and, and uh, Audible right away. I know the paperback has been... Uh, put on hold for a bit because of COVID-19. It was available for a little while and now I think it isn't again. Um, another question here. Do you think that severity of symptoms can indicate how stubborn the insulin resistance is, how long it will take to reverse the hyperinsulinemia? For example, will it be easier to reverse for someone who has uh, irregular periods versus someone who has no periods, had no cycle at all? That's a great question. Um, it, it, it's hard to answer that question because your expression of insulin resistance, again, is very individual. And, and, and again, we're all on this spectrum, right? We're all on this um, somewhere on the spectrum. You might be way lower down where your insulin resistance is nil, or you might be way further up where your insulin resistance is, is very, very high. So can we measure insulin resistance based on not having periods at all or having irregular periods? No, unfortunately, that's not how it goes. That's, I think, genetic and, and really individual. But any of those symptoms that you've just mentioned are expressions of insulin resistance. So again, knowing the problem will help us find the solution. And that's what our book, uh, The PCOS Plan, is trying to do. It's trying to help you find the solution. So whether you have irregular periods or you haven't had a period at all for years, which we work with women, I work with women who haven't had a period for years uh, or ever. Uh, I, I now have a, a young lady who's trying to conceive. And her question to me is actually, do you... Nadia, this is a question I was going to share with you guys today. Have you ever worked with somebody who's never had a period and uh, has gotten pregnant? So the answer to that is, in order for you to get pregnant, you have to ovulate. All right. So 
as I said before, you can have periods every single month and not ovulate and then you won't get pregnant. So in order for you to be able to get, so my job with this young lady and uh, to answer your question is to get you to, if you're in premenopausal years, you should be getting yourself to the point where you're ovulating and then things will start to get better. Because again, it's insulin that's preventing this ovulation. And this is, I think, very well written in our book. So thank you for your question. Erica has a question here. How long do you recommend trying a protocol before you decide it is not working? I'm guessing weight loss would indicate it's working, but how long should you wait to move on if you feel that fasting protocol isn't working? This is a great question. So I think that for some people, and maybe Erica, this, is, this might be you or somebody that you're uh, wondering about, maybe weight is your expression of insulin resistance and therefore you want to try a protocol and you want to try it long enough to see if it's working for that expression specifically. I'm sure you've heard of NSVs, non-scale victories, and we talk about this all the time, meaning that weight is not the one and only expression of success. And for many of us, it isn't at all, myself included. Weight was never an issue for me. I did start gaining weight once my insulin resistance, once I was way up on the spectrum, I started to gain weight. But again, on the scale, it wasn't significant. I was never, I think, uh, above, I don't even know, 25 BMI, for those of you that know what that means. It doesn't mean very much, but my body composition was horrendous, meaning that I didn't weigh very much, but I had a lot of fat, particularly visceral fat, fat in my organs. So weight may be, may be one expression, and it may be a, uh, an expression that you're looking for. I think that there are much better expression, much better ways to measure progress than weight. Probably measurements, uh, if you have a chance, I know right now none of us can, but if you eventually get a chance to do a DEXA scan uh, of your body composition or something similar, but just to answer your question specifically, for women specifically, because premenopausal women are cyclical, or at least are supposed to be cyclical, meaning you're supposed to have a cycle and a regular one, and I want that to be very clear. If you don't have a cycle and it's not regular, and if you're not ovulating, then, then you must address that, okay? I know for some it might not seem important if you're not trying to get pregnant, but pregnancy shouldn't be our only focus here with PCOS. Why? And this is, I hope, is very, that I, we, this was my part of the book that I was very uh, interested in emphasizing were all the associated risks and, and problems with PCOS. So it's not the irregular periods, as Dr. Fung says. If PCOS was just about a little bit of acne and a few missed periods, it wouldn't be a big deal. But that is not what PCOS is. PCOS is an insulin-resistant condition caused by hyperinsulinemia, which will then lead to metabolic syndrome. And PCOS is one expression of metabolic syndrome. Unfortunately, all the other ones will come with time. So is weight the only thing that we're looking at? No, but if weight is one of your expressions and you're looking for a fasting protocol that is going to address that, I think that for a woman that's cyclical, or at least supposed to be cyclical, it makes sense that you would follow something adequately. So if you either have a coach that recommends something for you, or you're following proper resources, you've read enough and, you've, and you're uh, pretty certain that the fasting protocol that you're following seems adequate, I would do it for about four weeks. That's the only way that, because there is different phases of our cycle where we're not going to lose weight. And other phases where we lose a lot of weight. That's the cyclical pattern of women. So I would give it four weeks, uh, but I would definitely make sure I'm following proper resources, all right? All right, everyone, this was great. Thank you so much for tuning in, nice and early for some of you. Those of you that weren't here, I hope you get to watch this later. And I will be back tomorrow. Um, if you haven't already joined uh, the TFM um, Instagram page, I'll be doing a live there tomorrow. Hopefully I won't have any technical trouble, but I, I, I can never really know when that's going to happen. Um, and next week I will be having a Zoom web webinar. So a one hour Zoom webinar Well, I will be answering uh, some of these questions and some of uh, other questions that I've gotten over email. So if you'd like to join that Zoom webinar, my email is nadia at thefastingmethod.com. Please send me your question, particularly if it pertains to our book, The PCOS Plan. Send me the question with a page reference or something and I will see you then. Okay, bye everyone.